Thank you everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to our presentation today, the fast and the functional pragmatic strategy for a successful website reader. Um, just before we get into it today, I'm just going to give you a little intro. So, I'm Alex. <laughs> um, I've been a web dev for about two years now, maybe a bit over, and I've been working with Pragma for about one and a bit of those. Um, I, how I started here was I was a graduate with, from the University of Canberra with a Bachelor of Software Engineering. That's where I really picked up my passion for web design, for web development. And I've really kicked off from there. And that's why I'm working on Drupal sites. And since we're based in Canberra, a lot of those being our CMS sites. Um, this is my second Drupal South, last one being in Brisbane. So it was really exciting. And now that I'm standing here in front of you in New Zealand, it's really special stuff. So. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Um, I'm Emily Mills. I'm a managing consultant at Pragma Partners. I've been there for about two years. Um, at Pragma, I'm currently leading an agile team um, of developers, um, UX designers, and content designers for one of our um, major CMS projects. Um, also, while I've been at Pragma, I've led user research, content design, um, and content strategy for a number of other um, Australian government services. Um, but before that, I actually have a background in communications and marketing, um, not development, so I've um, <laughs> got that different perspective. Um, a little bit about Pragma. Um, as I said, we're based in Canberra. Um, we mostly work with Australian government clients. Um, we do um, service design, solution architecture, web development, content design, um, and we have three practices um, within our team. So we have our content and experience design practice, which uh, I'm in. We've got our um, digital practice, which Al's in, and we've also got a research and design practice. So our scope of um, you know things that we can do is, is quite large, which is fantastic. Lots of cool projects. All right, so I'm just going to give you a quick taste of what's to come with this uh, presentation. So Em and I are going to give you the tools to drive and pitch your own, uh, sorry, drive your own fast and functional pitch and reboot with your client. Um, we'll give you. We'll take you through some of our experiences, what challenges we came through, how to advocate for change. Um, we'll give you tips to set up your team for success and how to stay on track. So pretty much everything. Um, and if you're lucky, you can have some tips at the end for your next project. So let's just get started. Anyway. Thanks, Al. So um, we'll be looking at a case study today um, for, as I mentioned, one of our large LCMS projects. This is essentially how we persuaded our longest Drupal client that tech debt is worth fixing um, and how great sales, design and product management really enables technical excellence. Um, so we'll be talking about the case study, but really any of the strategies that we're chatting about today, you can implement these in your own um, projects or even day to day when working with your stakeholders. So a bit of a background, um, in 2020, we were engaged by the Australian Cyber Security Centre to improve their website cyber.gov.au. A few of you might be familiar with this. I know a couple of presos yesterday spoke about Essential 8 and ISM. Those things live um, on this website. Um, it's essentially the Australian government's one-stop shop for um, Australians, businesses and government to um, really improve their cyber security and help them stay secure online. So within our team, um, we've got some awesome experts from across disciplines, so devs and designers, um, and we all really work collaboratively to enhance the site. Um, once we uh, were on board with the project, um, one of the main things that is really important to us at Pragma is user-centred and evidence-based design. So a key part of this work was testing the site with users, um, really to identify any of those pain points and areas for improvement. Um, so this testing led to us um, to creating a new information architecture for the website, as well as redesigning um, all of the site's pages to make them more contemporary and user uh, usable. Um, so after deciding to implement these things, we're at a point where we had helped the front end users, um, but there were pain points from other users to consider as well. And it was us and our stakeholders. Um, and yes, devs are users too. Um, we decided that in implementing these new page designs and IA, it would be actually a really good opportunity to rebuild the whole site from scratch, totally from the ground up, start from new. So why did we decide to rebuild um, instead of retrofitting it? Um, Al will share some insights as to how we kind of came to that decision. All right, so the question is, why rebuild instead of retrofit? Well, before we can get into that, um, I'll take you back in the past and indulge you in some of our pain points. 
and as a bunch of them will start with the So, first up, the previous workflow of getting pieces from dev to production was a pretty slow and grueling task. This was pretty manual, it could take from 30 to 50 minutes. And when you're talking about a government client, potential emergency updates, and you don't really want those kind of numbers. You don't have to fix it then wait 30 minutes, 50 minutes, potentially. Next up, we have messy repository. So, we have heaps of features coming in from left and right. And a lot of the time, there's big new ones coming in that just take priority and leave these smaller features in the dust. So then our backend just gets kind of filled up with all these stale branches and it gets quite tricky around here. Um, next up, which is a personal pain point for me, it's really bad for devs, um, is disabled config. Um, and we disabled this in Gusty and that's just due to our own some other issues. But uh, this is really painful for developers. So when you're building like a block, for example, um, usually you just be able to export that and then push that into your staging environment and it'll just be as easy as that. But with config disabled, you have to build that block once, twice, three times, maybe that's just having so much extra work. Um, next up we have manually compiling CSS and JS files. This is, isn't as bad, but it still just adds additional steps to the whole development flow. Um, this can add conflicts to um, pushes. It just adds a bunch of risk. Maybe resolving the issues or even pushing the, uh, the compiled files up in the first place. So that's just not the best. So this is just the back end, and you already get like a pretty clear picture of what's going on. So uh, time for the front end. There was like 40 content types, you know, blocks, views, paragraphs, and taxonomies everywhere. And that's like more than enough for any uh, any application ever, surely. But um, just made it really hard to know what was being used and what wasn't. So that's not really good for the end users with potential inconsistencies on the front end or for our content editors who have to navigate those 40 content types. Maybe our designers who have to go through the thousands of components we have on our site or our devs who have to fix everything and figure out where they are. So why not just fix one of these issues? By the time we find the issue, resolve it, deploy it, and then find the next issue. Probably like start up on a new side by now. So back to the main question. Why rebuild instead of retrofit? So retrofitting would be really tricky. Pulling all those content types and blocks and views and stuff all down to a maintainable now while maintaining the core design, the editor experience and the functionality inside would be really tricky. But we could do it. It only just really fixes the front end. And you also know now that about the previous issues, that that's not really going to help. We still have all the issues in the back end, the same environment, the same code base, the same tools, and a lot of the same other issues. Um, if we want to rebuild, you can just imagine what you could do, pretty much anything. For example, content editors would have um, less convoluted creation, uh, easy to navigate front ends, designers would have consistency across the site, a maintainable amount of components, and the devs could really have new tools, easier workflows, quicker to deploy and develop things. I could go on about this for a long time, but you know, I should probably pass on that now so she can tell you about advocating for change. Thanks, Al. Um, so after considering all of these things, um, the next step was really to advocate for change with our stakeholders. So our role was to help them understand the issues that were being experienced across the site but also all of the great opportunities that would then come from implementing this idea. So um, to do this, we needed to come to them prepared and use what I've just decided to call the three Ps. Um, so the first step was understanding the problem state um, and gathering any evidence that we could. So this was about identifying what we were trying to solve, who it affected and what the impacts were. So I planted the seed with our client, flagging any issues with them and, and letting them know that there was opportunity for improvement. Um, we then gathered previous user research and, and site performance analytics. Our team documented examples of the issues we experienced and their impacts, so a lot of the things that Al spoke to. And then we also reviewed the site against best practice standards and guidelines. The second step was then identifying possible solutions. So I got input from the whole team, so devs, designers, as well as program management, just to ensure that all perspectives were considered um, and find out what was actually feasible in doing this. For each option, I outlined the key tasks to implement, any risks, mitigations, 
um, indicative timeline and resources that it might take. So how long would it actually take to do this? Who needed to be involved? And if there was going to be any other impact on, on work items? I think something that I've learned along the way is the value of preparing solutions to take to the stakeholders instead of just coming to them with a problem. So, you know, really being able to preempt their questions and have all that basis covered goes a really long way to helping us and them get buy-in from not only their team, but perhaps when they're, um, you know, raising this with the executive, they have that really strong evidence base. The final step, or the third P, um, is being proactive and, and sharing this with the stakeholders. So um, we have documented the problem state, the evidence, the research, and then our recommendations. Uh, we then share this with our client for their consideration and then organise the time to chat about it in person and catch up once they've had some time to actually digest it and go through it. Um, it was in this catch up uh, in person that we invited their feedback and any other considerations that we should be aware of. Um, have, doing it this way and, and kind of bringing them along the journey um, really helps with their buy-in um, and it also makes them feel like they're adding value um, and, and taking ownership of that as well. So, <laughs> once we had the stakeholder buy-in um, and we were ready to kick off, um, it was time to set the team up for success. So, this was a 12-week project um, and we had a lot to do in not much time. So, there were some key things to establish um, before we actually picked up the tools, both within our team and with our stakeholders. So, what were we doing, when were we doing it, what's in scope and what's out of scope? So we worked in an agile approach in sprints and we used our agile project management tools like JIRA and Confluence. Um, but there were a couple of key things that helped us along, um, which I'll talk specifically about. Um, the first one is our project plan. So as a team, we worked with our stakeholders to develop a really comprehensive plan, which then served as our source of truth throughout the whole project. Um, this included everyone's roles and responsibilities. It also included um, project milestones, the schedule of work, items in scope, um, you know, what we were actually on the hook to deliver. So this was listing out exactly every, you know, view, block, web form that would be building just so everyone knew exactly what was happening. Um, this plan also helped with setting expectations so um, everyone could really uh, clearly understand what would be delivered and when, how we'll work as a team and also what each activity looks like. So. For example, your uh, stakeholder might not have ever done user acceptance testing before or, um, you know, content migration. So having something like this can really help clarify any misconceptions um, and help them understand, you know, the, the purpose and outcomes of each activity. Um, the other thing that uh, we found really important and helpful was flagging risks early as well as identifying their medication. So, Throughout the project, I'm sure we are all uh, aware that things can probably go wrong or some things uh, might happen unexpectedly. Um, so we worked really hard to make sure that our team felt empowered to fly risks early. Um, how did we do this? Everyone in the team was seen as a trusted expert um, and they were given aspects of certain, given ownership of certain aspects of the project. So for example, one of our team members, Rich, who was in charge of content migration, Al, he was our web form guy, um, so they had the um, freedom to go directly to the client um, and have communication whenever they needed without necessarily having to go through the project lead every time. Um, and I think this constant communication as well as the expectation setting and the project plan, it really reassured our stakeholders that we knew what we were doing um, and that if something went wrong, we were prepared to deal with it. Um, so those are some of the methods for kind of setting up the project on a high level and, and working with the stakeholders. But Al um, is going to get into the nitty-gritty of, of what tools we actually use to do this. All right. So I'm just going to give you an idea of the tools you use to be fast and functional. Um, so this was like a pretty quick project, right? Um, so we wanted um, we, we wanted two things pretty much out of it, like speed and improved developer experience. Uh, we wanted to use tools that we as the developers wanted to use things we felt comfortable using and things we knew would help us get it done quick. So previously we were working on Gov CMS SAS um, and we knew there some limitations around deployment and the module usage and stuff like that, which is great and it's like helped me hundreds of times, especially in production environments. Um, but these little things do add a little bit of time to deployments. So since we wanted to be fast, um, we thought we could do without these features. 
So instead, we use platform as hedge. Um, this is like a sandbox for us, and it's pretty pretty easy to set up. So our prior knowledge using this let us set up our environments really quick, and it let us just get straight into our work. Um, it helped us migrate a large amount of pages on the site, and we didn't really need to worry about what tools were supported and what wasn't, or how would we how would we even begin working with it, since we already had used it and succeeded using it before. Um, it just kind of gave peace of mind to the lead and all the developers working on it. Um, next up is configuring the deployment. This is like really big because it just fixes a lot of those pain points in the first part. So we compile files, a thing in the past. Now we just have a script that just runs during the deployment, which compiles those files for us. So there's no compiling on our end. Uh, there's no conflicts when we compile it because we don't have to do that at all. It saves a bunch of time, lowers risk, and it just reduces the steps in total development. All this talk of compiled files though, what about the other tools? So uh, we were previously using like Webpack, SAS, Gold, Reactor, and NPM, and don't get me wrong, these great tools. It just depends on your project. But for ours, we wanted to be quick and pretty simple. So we used things that didn't really have such a niche or just for config files, um, or that were a choice tool for our developers. So it really came down to three things in the end. One, we wanted to use tools that we were comfortable with. Two, we wanted to use something that we were, was quick and simple. And three, something that we could debug and understand what was going on. So first up, we used Lando, which is pretty much a local environment tool. Um, it's really easy to set up, and the reusability is, is really good. So either you can go online and get a boilerplate um, for a config file and just kind of set up through that. But if you're lucky like us, you have a previous project you can use that's using that. Pull that into your project, rename some files, rename some things, and you can set up. Um, and that's, that's great, that's a breeze. So next up, we have Parcel, and that's pretty much worked out of the box as well. We just have a few plugins for things like view, post CSS, and tailwind, and then everything files in the same area. So it makes it really simple, really easy. Um, we swapped out React to view. This really came down to the people who were using it. So our previous implementation was a bit confusing. We had about two different bits of code kind of accomplishing the same thing on our site and are written in slightly different ways, which just kind of makes it hard to understand around the purpose. Um, with the features in view, we thought we could reduce the code complexity and just make it easier for us to understand in general. Um, and while we're doing it, we can merge those two bits of React code into one at the same time. Um, this kind of just helps maintain the site and maintain the code for the components using view. In the end, it just leaves us with a, a local environment that sets up in minimal steps. It's really hard to mess any of these steps up, and it's just quicker. So these things help us, and may not help you. It just really depends on what your project is looking for. Since we want reusable, simple, and quick stuff, this will be used. And if your developers aren't really comfortable using these tools, or confident using them, you got to wonder if it's even the right tool for you. Thank you. So, um, you know <laughs> to how to set your team up for success. You have the tools to do it now, and you have a plan all laid out, but uh, how do you stay on track and adapt to the change? So, teamwork. Teamwork's a good one. Um, during my time on this project, I ran into like five key points that helped us, and I thought it helped the team. So let's start from the top here, we have goals and objectives. So our team comprised of people who were currently on the project or were previously working on it. Everyone knew the issues the site already had, and they already had their own improvements that they wanted to make the site. And like, that's perfect. You have a team that's motivated, they all know the, the previous and the original issues, and they have a chance to improve their future use of the site. Um, it makes it really easy to communicate what you want out of the site, and speak on future improvements. And this kind of leads into the communication. So being uh, this is like a statement for any project, right? Communication is a big thing. But uh, for, this was no exception on our project. So our Slack channels were popping off constantly. Our response time was really low and just everyone was jumping in at all times. Um, 
all this open communication, like sitting on calls for hours, asking me about you know, what, what I would like out of the site, things that I struggled with, tools that I would like to see on the site, really just made it easy, figuring out each other's strengths and weaknesses. And this kind of leads into collaboration. So all this communication helped everyone on the team know each other's strengths and weaknesses. It made it really easy to uh, designate work to each other and to dish out work that complements each other's strengths. So for example, I was the web form guy, as you know before. So if there was a web form question, he came straight to me. And there was a component guy, when it came to components, I didn't have to even think about it. It was great. It just makes it really easy to send that work to people and rely on your peers. Um, next up is flexibility. This is a little bit different, but it really goes under the radar. In a fast-paced environment, you can get in over your head really quickly. So just be flexible, even when you're not really familiar with the issues that are arising. So we have an example here. We had like a web form that was broken, and everyone knew it was a bit broken. And the developers were kind of like assuming that it was code-related, I guess. And we had a manager that looked over our shoulder and was like, it's broken. I don't know why, but it's broken. Yeah. Just had a brief look at it and realized that it was something through the UI that we could have fixed. So it just goes to show that people think differently, look from different perspectives. And it's always good to get there and look at things. It can just take you out of your loop and change your perspective as well. But ultimately, it changes. I mean, ultimately, it helps every time it's possible. Awesome. Next up is trust. And I know this one sounds a little cheesy, but it really brings all these puzzle pieces together. Having trust in your team members, knowing that everyone's in it for the same outcome. Everyone's working on the same, same timeline. Everyone just wants the better experience out of the site. You know that they're going to complete their tasks and raise any issues if they run into it. It just removes any concerns that you have with working on the team. And instead, it just helps you get the things done. So now that you know about how to work with the team, Emily can take you through how to work with the same problem. Thanks, Al. So as well as working fabulously as a team, we have some really positive ways that help us work with our client and stakeholders. So um, as I spoke a little about before the project plan, um, you know, this was that source of truth that we could all refer to along the way to help manage expectations. Um, a second thing that was really fantastic was maintaining a transparent workflow. So we actually invited our client into JIRA, um, our project management tool for visibility and also to streamline the, the work and review process. So within this, um, you know, once a ticket um, had been completed and it was ready for review, we would tag um, our client's dev in it, we put it in a special column called client review, um, and they could just jump in there really quickly and have all the context that they needed um, from that particular issue, um, all the links, and they could just go, yep, tick, and then they can then move it to the done column. So it's, it's so helpful in, in kind of reducing that, I guess, time of going back and forth with emails. Um, you know, inboxes weren't flooded and, you know, heaps of people weren't cc into things where it was just a lot of back and forth. So having that um, transparent workflow was just so fantastic in, in helping us. Um, the, the third thing as well um, was, yeah, keeping receipts. So um, keeping track of decisions. So um, while, you know, you might like to use a formal decision register, um, we just actually used a really simple method to ensure that we captured key decisions and discussion points throughout the whole project. So um, after all our meetings with our stakeholders or ad hoc phone calls, um, we would just follow this up with an email essentially summarising what we spoke about, any decisions that were made and any action items. So not only does this show um, everyone how fantastic you are at keeping on top of things, um, it can also uh, help when you need to go back to a uh, previous discussion or try to remember, you know, something that was decided previously. Um, sending this right after a meeting while it's still fresh in your mind as well can really help clarify any misunderstandings right away. So, you know, you can shoot off the, the email and, you know, the client or stakeholder can come back and go, oh, you know, the, the third point, what I actually meant by that was X, Y, Z. Um, and that way everyone's on the same page right away instead of, you know, perhaps progressing onto the work and then coming back and they go, that's not what I had in mind. Um, so that, that really helps with, with that. Um, the other thing as well was having regular catch-ups. So, of course, we had our fortnightly planning and review meetings, um, but we would also have ad hoc catch-ups, particularly um, with our dev and, and the client's dev. So towards the end of the project, as we near crunch time, we also had um, really quick catch-ups at the end of each day. So it was only about 15 minutes at 4 o'clock every day. 
Um, and this is a chance to give our stakeholders visibility of, of current work progress and really instill confidence into them that things were on track and moving. Um, and it was also a fantastic opportunity for our team to get really time critical feedback. Um, you know, knowing that we're chatting with the client every single day, um, we could just kind of say our questions or things that were burning and we could just chat about it in person. Um, kind of in, in relation to this and catching up regularly, I think one of my top tips in this area is to know when to pick up the phone. Um, it might be uncomfortable for some people to, to get up on a call, but it really helps kind of iron things out really quickly. So, you know, sometimes you might get an email or a request from the client um, and you're kind of just left scratching your head. I'm sure we've all been there. Um, in this instance, it's really helpful to just pick up the phone and, and chat it out. You know, so often things can be quickly clarified over the phone instead of kind of going back and forth over email. Um, and again, you know, I would just shoot off a, an email after the saying, you know, thanks for your time on the phone. You know, here's what we chatted about. Um, just to kind of keep that record as well of, of those things. Um, finally, working flexibly. Um, Al touched on this as, as a team, how we did it. But in terms of working with the client, um, you know, as much as we would love exactly to stick to a plan or kind of what we envisaged, sometimes things are just out of our control or out of our client's control. So, you know, in these situations, sometimes, you know, it's, it is what it is um, and we have to be responsive and adaptive to that. Um, but I think one of the, the key things to, to remember is that, you know, we're all on the same team. So us and the stakeholder, we're all on the same team and, you know, we're all working towards the same goals. You know, we all want a good outcome at the end of the day. So we have packed a whole lot in there. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, some of our, I guess, key takeaways from each phase, you know, pitching the project or advocating for change, uh, setting up for success and staying on track. So when we're looking at advocating for change, it's about planting the seed early, being prepared, and also being open to feedback. Setting up for success, you know, maintain that source of truth, define roles, responsibilities, and clear expectations as well as flagging risks early. And then staying on track, play to each other's strengths, communicate early and often, and remember we're all on the same team. Um, so as we reflect on that, um, I'd like to invite, if anyone had any questions or, or thoughts that they'd like to chat about, um, please sing it out. Yeah. So um, you mentioned the project's 12 weeks. Yes. What's within the scope? 12 weeks. Okay, yep. So what was in scope for the 12 week project? Essentially, what we did, um, so the, the, the current site still main, remained live, and so what we were doing was building a second website in the background, and then we did a forklift, um, and essentially took over that site um, when the time was ready. So what was in scope, it was literally rebuilding the site from scratch. From so the from, from design all the way to build. Yeah, so um, earlier in the project, we had um, our UX designer had designed um, like the page and all that type of thing, we had the design system. Um, so when it came to actually implementing the project, there were just a few kind of kinks that we ironed out in the design system in the early weeks, and it was literally building every component, building every, like, wasn't it? It was just... It was, it was pretty intense. Yeah. <laughs> long day. So you, you designed everything from new research to design to build. Yeah, we designed everything. So from, from end to end, we, we did the whole thing. So our team, we have content designers, we have UX designers, and we have developers. So um, part of it included as well um, in terms of implementing the new information architecture. We actually had a bunch of content changes as well. So pages that were either being archived or merged or all this type of stuff. So we'd actually rewritten as well, like over 100 pages um, that was also going on. So while the, the devs were building the site, we also had our content team like doing some really gnarly <laughs> uplift work with um, with the budget content as well. Anything you want to add on that one? Hey, just to clarify, when you said that you were using the platform for it, was that just during the development stage of core velocity or did you finally launch on platform? Yeah, so why did we use platform? Why did you use it? Did you, did you launch on it or, did, or was it just as a like, development um, sandbox? Did we launch it? platform what it means is the development the sandbox. Yeah. yeah, we did. We just use it as a sandbox for development. Okay, and then just at some there. stage you put it to the SAS program. Yeah, once we were uh, finished with like the majority of the site, then we did our forklift to go see Yeah, and, and that forklift occurred um, probably about a week before the site went live. 
So we had it um, there just so we could do that final UAT um, and, and protesting and all that type of thing as well. So we could yeah be really confident that it would work um, before we made the, the transition. Was it a success? Like compared to like you know you list all the problems at the beginning about the tech stuff and the, the editorial experience. Do you think after the twelve weeks that the end product that you did all those? Was it a success after the twelve weeks that we hit it? I think so, yes. yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot easier in the back end now. It's just so much easier and quicker to do all the things that we did before. So, mm-hmm. and from the client's perspective. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, from the client's perspective, um, they think so as well. One of the things that we've been, um, you know, some, some really fantastic feedback from was probably two days after the cycle launched, there was something really critical that had to be um, published at like 11 pm, and the client was able to just go in and, and do that um, really easily without sort of any help from us um, in terms of actually doing it. They knew where everything was, they knew how to put the content in and, and all that type of thing. So um, that was really cool to see um, just straight away, um, you know, something like that, particularly in a, in a time crunch. Um, that's kind of really what we're working for. I was going to ask, I was gonna ask Alex how, how long your backlog is now. Is there much tech left over or is it? Um, is there much tech tech left over? Yeah, in, like, do you have a backlog? Our things for the future, or is there stuff that we do differently? Um, there's always features and stuff that are coming through, but really, like any issues that are rolled over into the smooth thing, not really. We have like a lot of that was ironed out in the first week, but like just going through those UAT fixes. But um, other than that, yeah, it's pretty good. You can have more fix. Um, I'll just add to that as well. So, um, in the UAT process, any issues that we came up, we kind of had like a, a defect classification uh, guide. So we'd have like P1, which was like priority one that we'd have to have done, you know, before launch. Um, and then we kind of had other ones that were like, okay, let's kind of get this fixed sooner rather than later. Um, and then we had lower priority items, which is, you know, just like minor styling issues and, and those types of things across the site. So um, yeah, as Al said, most of that stuff got ironed out pretty much straight away or even before um, production. But, you know, we do have a backlog of just minor, like, styling things that, you know, we're just kind of working through. But, yeah, the, the website launched um, on the 13th of April, so literally a month ago. Um, so it's been pretty fantastic to, to not really have a backlog of tech tech. <laughs> awesome. Let's give them a big applause.